Good morning. And before we start class with prayer, I just want to make an announcement to let you know what, uh, what your support of our ministry is going to, going to allow us to do this fall. This fall, there is a, and I will pass this around if somebody would like to look at it. It's a little flyer for the American Association of Christian Counselors World Convention in Nashville in September. They're expecting, and I've been to this several times, over 7,000 uh, Christian pastors and counselors from all over the country. And we're going to be there, and we're going to be giving away um, 7,000 copies of Could It Be This Simple? over 5,000 of our DVD sets, uh, 10,000 of our Bible study guides. Um, we will, uh, I will be doing two uh, speaking presentations while, while there to the group. Uh, we will also have um, our uh, fundamental focus. We're going to take uh, probably 10,000 of those to give away and, uh, and other resources that we're going to just distribute to, to this group of pastors and counselors from all over the country and start sowing some seeds. And we're able to do that because of, uh, of your support. So if you want to pass that around, let people look at that. They're going to be people like Max Licato and others, uh, John Eldridge, if you've heard of him. Uh, these types of people will be in attendance at, uh, at this event. And we're just thankful that the Lord has given us the opportunity to, to share this message with, with these people. All right, let's begin with prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that uh, you are God of love. We ask that your spirit will be here this morning to give us uh, hearts like yours, character like yours, that our minds will work in the avenues that you have laid out for us, that we will love truth and love each other, and that we will come to know you more fully. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. In our lesson, as you know, we're doing the second lesson in this uh, quarter, um, Major Lessons for Minor Prophets, and the title this week is Love and Judgment, God's Dilemma, Hosea. Love and Judgment, God's Dilemma, Hosea. But before we turn to the actual lesson, and this week I was going through my morning devotion and I came across a, a passage, and as you know, one of the things we teach in here is that when Christ came, he came to uh, be the remedy for sin and that the Holy Spirit takes what Christ has achieved and, and puts it and, and applies it to our lives to transform us, and, and I came across this in a little book called That I May Know Him and by Ellen White. And this is what it says on page 94. The Holy Spirit reveals Christ to the mind and faith takes hold of him. If you accept Christ as your personal Savior, you will know by experience the value of the great sacrifice made on your behalf upon the cross of Calvary. The Spirit of Christ working upon the heart conforms it to his image, for Christ is the model upon which the Spirit works. Christ is the model upon which the Spirit... So what is it, what is it describing? Christ, you know, what Christ achieved, the Holy Spirit is remodeling or remodeling us in the image of Christ. Um, by the ministry of his word, by his providences, and by his inward working, God stamps the likeness of Christ upon the soul. To possess Christ is your first work. And to reveal him as one who is able to save to the uttermost all who come to him is your next work. If you think about work out your salvation with fear and trembling, your first work is to possess Christ. And your second work is to reveal Christ to others. That's it. I mean, sometimes we get off on all these other things. Your first work is to get cheese out of your diet. No, it's to possess Christ. And your second work is to reveal him. Um, to serve the Lord with a full purpose of heart is to honor and glorify his name by dwelling upon holy things, by having a mind filled with vital truths revealed in his word. Goodness, meekness, gentleness, patience, and love are the attributes of Christ's character. If you have the spirit of Christ, your character will be molded after his character. You see, is it, note it, no, who's doing the molding? Is, is it a work you have to do? Is it your responsibility to, to fix and heal yourself? Or is it your responsibility to stay connected to Christ and he molds you? You see? Okay. So, let's go to Sabbath lesson. And what do you think about this week's title, which is called Love and Judgment, God's Dilemma, Hosea? Any thoughts about the title? The, uh, the, the, yes, Russell. Is, is there a dilemma? I mean, is there a dilemma? Is there, is there a difference between love and judgment? Well, and if we read the memory verse, the, the title is taken from the King James Version, I think, of this same verse, and they're using an NIV version here. And notice the NIV version of this verse. It says, but you must return to your God, maintain love and justice, and wait for your God always. And I think the King James Version says, maintain love and judgment. But this says, maintain love and justice in this version, and, and wait for your God always. So if we look at this, what do you think about the idea of maintaining love and justice? Is, is your comment the same? We substitute judgment for justice. Is there a difference? I don't think so. So I guess we should ask the question, what do you understand love to be first? What is love? 
Selflessness. Selflessness, okay. Any other, any other comments? What is love? Yes. Well, to me, love and judgment. Judgment uh, is something that is imposed upon you uh, as uh, compared with what the member says that you are to maintain <coughs> love and justice toward others, as it were. Okay, so, and again, this is why we want to talk about this, because the way we define the words, for instance, judgment can mean something that a court or some other person imposes upon you. But judgment can also mean an ability. Do you have good judgment? See, the same word can mean something done to you or something you possess. You were given judgment by God. Oh, judgment and ability to discern, to make judgments. It could mean that too. So love and justice, then, if we look at that. Maybe we should ask the question, as we think about what love is, I would like to suggest the idea that love is more than an emotion. It's a principle. It's a, it's a methodology. God is love. He's not merely a warm fuzzy. He's bigger than a warm fuzzy. And I would suggest that God being love, when he went about to create, the creator builds. And when he builds, he builds things to operate in certain ways. I would suggest that he, operate, he builds his universe to operate in harmony with him. Anybody think that that's out of line to say? That when God creates, the way he creates things is to operate in harmony with him. Any disagreement? Which means he builds things to operate upon love. That's how they're built. That's the protocol for life. The law of love, a building, a building uh, protocol. The principle of giving, as we've talked about before, Every breath you take, you give away carbon dioxide, and the plants give back oxygen to you. A circle of giving, how things were built. An evidence of love, principle of giving. Well, as we keep that idea of love in mind, because we're talking about love and justice, what's justice? In the following little section in the notes is an excerpt from my new book, how The God-Shaped Brain, How Changing Your View of God Transforms Your Life. And this is what it says on page 186. On September 20, 2011, just nine days after terrorists attacked the United States in four hijacked passenger jets, President George W. Bush addressed a joint session of Congress. In that speech, President Bush stated, whether we bring our enemies to justice or bring justice to our enemies, justice will be done. What is President Bush suggesting justice is? Vengeance. I heard vengeance. Retribution. Retribution. Hunting down and killing those who planned and carried out this, these, these attacks. Do, do you think the president's words reflect God's attitude toward wayward humanity? Does the justice of a vengeful nation accurately represent the justice of God? Is it right to conclude God runs his universe like sinful beings run earthly governments? Is it right to conclude that? Or do we misrepresent God and obstruct his healing love when we construe God's justice to be like our own? Was Jesus suggesting God's government is different from ours when he said, quote, my kingdom, in other words, my government, my kingdom, is not of this world? Is there a reason the Bible uses ferocious beasts to represent earthly governments, but a lamb to represent Jesus? Could this suggest something different about how the two systems operate? Could human justice and God's justice be different? What do you think? How? How? What is the basis? If you think about justice, what is the basis for justice in any system? What's the, what's the foundation upon which justice? Another word for justice is? Righteousness. Righteousness or rightness. What's the basis for the right thing? The just the thing? Land. Pardon? The law of the land. The law of the land. So another little section out of the book. Justice in any system is based on the law of that organization. Punching someone in the face is just in boxing, but unjust in baseball. The rules of the various sports governing bodies determine what is just, an unjust or, un, or a just or unjust action is. Driving at 160 miles an hour on the Autobahn is, in Germany, is just or right, but not so in the United States because the United States has a different set of laws. So what is the basis of justice in the United States? 
In this country, what do we base justice upon? The law of land, but, but imposed law. Pardon? Imposed, imposed law. law. Okay, and ultimately, you know, there's a lot of cases going through the Supreme Court right now. And what did the Supreme Court base its interpretation of? Law? Constitution. Constitution. So ultimately, it comes back to the Constitution, and then all the laws have to harmonize with the Constitution. <coughs> what is the basis of justice in God's government? Uh, love. The law of love. The law of love. Is the law of love like human law? Imposed. And this is the big, this is the big demarcation. When, when Daniel 7 prophesied that a, a power would arise and seek to change God's law, how do you think that a power sought to change God's law? Many allege that the seeking to change God's law was a seeking to change the commandments. Now think this through with me. Number one. Number two, about the, about the images. Remove number two, no, no graven images. No, not number one. Number two. No graven images. Number four, number 10. Split number 10 into two, so we still have 10 after you remove number two. See, number 10 in the one version, our version, is thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, thy neighbor's property, or anything that's thy neighbor's. In, in another version, there, there's number nine is thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, and number 10 is thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's property. So two covets in that version. Because, 10, because two got eliminated, and four got ch changed to three. Okay, and, and many think this is, this is the change in the law. Think it through with me. Why doesn't a church organization, an ecclesiastical body, get together and vote to change the law of gravity? <laughs> <coughs> Why not? Why don't they vote to change the law of respiration? We don't need to breathe anymore to live. We, our, in our church, you don't have to breathe. <laughs> Why don't they vote to change that? You're laughing at me, but, but there's a point I'm making. They don't vote to change that law because they understand that that type of law is a natural law upon which life operates and it can't be changed. If you vote to change a law, what by definition have you accepted? That it's an imposed arbitrary law. Because you don't vote to change natural law. And the real change that the system did in the Christ minds of Christians is that God imposes law like a Roman emperor. And therefore the church can change that law or God can change that law. But the law of God is the expression of his character, the principle upon which life is built. It cannot be changed. Yes? I don't think they've really thought it through to that complete detail with, with the natural law. I think they're more interested and, and probably more focused on control and the imposed law my, my, allows them to control people. My point to you though is not that they thought it through, that they had already accepted it because they didn't try to change the laws that if they still understood God's law to be the natural law like gravity or love, they wouldn't have even tried that. But they've already accepted it's an imposed law. That's why they thought it was okay to change it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this idea has come down through Christianity and Christian groups have now fought over which day is the Sabbath, who can change it, who's got the right, rather than realizing that it's all, that's all subterfuge. That's a distraction. That keeps your mind away from the reality that even if you're arguing for the right day under an imposed law construct, you still bought the beast's idea that God imposes law and he's like a Roman emperor. And you're still operating under that system. So what is Bible justice? Notice, uh, notice from scripture. This is Isaiah 1, 16 and 17. Wash yourself clean. Stop all this evil I see you doing. Yes, stop doing evil and learn to do right. See that justice is done. Help those who are oppressed. Give orphans their rights and defend widows. What is justice in this verse? Doing the right thing. Doing the right thing, acting in love. Uh, because it's right. Doing what's right because it is right and right doing is pleasing to God. Isaiah 30, 18. The Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. The Lord is a God of justice. What is justice in this view? Being compassionate. How about this one? Jeremiah 21, 12. This is what the Lord says to the dynasty of David. Give justice each morning to the people you judge. Help those who have been robbed. Rescue them from the oppressor. What is biblical justice? 
saving the oppressed, not punishing the oppressor. So I was watching a show recently with my wife in which um, some, a young girl got murdered. It's one of those crime shows. And the investigators went to the parents uh, as they're uh, investigating the crime and said um, something along the lines, I don't know if the, if the parents said it or, or they said it, but don't worry, we'll see that whoever did this, you know, we'll bring them to justice. We'll see that justice is done. You know how they say this in these crime dramas all the time. We'll make sure that justice is done. And I looked at Christine and I said, no. I, I, I remember the comment now. We'll see that justice is done for your daughter. That's what they said. We'll see justice is done for your daughter. No. Let me tell you what justice is. Justice is putting things right. So when God does justice, he raises the girl back to life and restores her. That's justice. It puts life right. It doesn't punish the oppressor. That's a human Roman concept. When we put it off on God, we distort the God, the divine character. Jump to Wednesday's lesson. In the bottom paragraph, it says, Hosea 11 teaches that God's ways transcend those of sinful humanity. He will not let bitterness govern his decisions. God's love seeks to bring healing, health, and restoration to his people. The purpose of divine discipline is to correct, amend, and reconcile, not to destroy and avenge. Many people, even professed Christians, do not understand that aspect of God, but instead see him as vengeful, angry, and just looking to find fault in order to punish them for their sins. Even worse, some believe that he burns the lost in hell. Can I leave out the words for eternity? <coughs> for eternity. That, that, however, is not the picture of God presented here. I think this is well said. What do you think? Yeah. So what underpins the misunderstanding so many have regarding the differences between loving discipline and angry vengeance? Misunderstanding God's law and projecting human imposed law constructs on the divine government. This is a quote out of Prophets of Kings, page 311. Notice what she says. In Isaiah's day, the spiritual understanding of mankind was darkened through misapprehension of God. Long had Satan sought to lead men to look upon their creator as the author of sin and suffering and death. God, the author of death. Hmm. Those whom he has thus deceived imagined that God was hard and exacting. They regarded him as watching to denounce and condemn, unwilling to receive the sinner so long as there was a legal excuse for not helping him. The law of love by which heaven is, in other words, there had to be some legal exaction done in order to get God to forgive. And if that legal payment wasn't made, you see, God would still punish. This is how they conceived of God. There had to be a legal thing done. It's a lie. The law of love by which heaven is ruled had been misrepresented by the arch deceiver as a restriction upon men's happiness, a burdensome yoke from which they should be glad to escape. He declared that its precepts could not be obeyed and that the penalties of transgression were bestowed arbitrarily. In other words, the penalties of breaking God's law are not natural. They're not automatic. That's what, that's what this lie is. Yes? I have a question. Sure. Uh, you said that uh, you have an example that uh, someone killed a girl mm -hmm. and um, what is happening, nobody can... Uh, make justice to that guy and how many girls he has to kill to find out what is happening with him, him to do this. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm following the question. Did you ask the question? You said that ju the person who, mm -hmm. made, who, who killed the girl will have the justice, the life will give justice of him. That is the point? No. The point is that in, in justice to the girl who was murdered, to the girl who was murdered is not punishing the murderer. Justice to her is resurrecting her to life. That's the right thing to do to set right the wrong that was done to her. She was murdered. Give her her life back. That's the right thing to do. Yes. So just kind of going on what my mom is saying, I'm thinking of Romans um, 12, verse 19. Uh, it says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And we also have different places in Psalms where David talks about praying to God that God will punish those that are wicked, you know. So I, I do agree with you that justice includes, 
you know, doing the right thing for those that are suffering, but it seems that there's a lot of also verses in the Bible that talk about God giving punishment at the end, you know, in the last punishment, vengeance to those people that have spilled, you know, righteous blood. So I'm just wondering how would you explain those? Yes, I'm looking for a document here where I've got that written down. Vengeance. Um, it, are you using the biblical definition of vengeance, or are you using a human imposed law definition of vengeance? I'm using what the term vengeance means. In human definition. Let's let the Bible define what vengeance is for us, okay? Instead of letting your human dictionary do it. This is the problem that we have when we go to scripture. We take our human definition and project it into, just like they did, Roman imposed law, vengeance must punish. This is scripture, Isaiah 1, 24, 25. Therefore the Lord, the Almighty, the Mighty One of Israel declares, I will get relief from my foes and avenge myself on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you. I will thoroughly purge away your dross and remove all your impurities. Oh, what's vengeance here? Cleansing, healing. Let's go to another one. Isaiah 61, verse 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent, sent me to bind the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives and release of darkness to the prisoners, to proclaim the Lord of the year's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide to those who grieve in Israel, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. Wait a second, we're seeing very, something very strange here. Biblical vengeance is not this human idea of punishing the wicked. Biblical vengeance is the vengeance on the enemy. And the vengeance on the enemy, the best way to take vengeance on the enemy is to heal and restore to godliness the wicked. That's biblical vengeance. Well, well the issue is that in that second verse you read, right, that, that the righteous will receive the crown, right? But why, why can't we receive that now? Because we have... Satan, we have the enemy that is preying upon, right, us. So why are we going to be comforted? Because the devil is going to be gone. The wicked people will be destroyed. That's why we're going to be able to rejoice. So, you know, there's healing, but through that healing, there must be some destruction. Not, not because God wanted it to be, because people chose that road. And what do you understand destroys the sinner? Uh, for example, when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, the fire came down, people died. I mean, that is not a natural consequence to me. This is a classic argument that people often make because they misunderstand the difference between, in fact, maybe we should move on in our lesson, they misunderstand the difference between sleeping in the grave until resurrection and the punishment for sin. What is the punishment for sin? Non-existence. Death, which is defined in scripture as sleeping in the grave until resurrection. The wages of sin is sleeping in the grave until resurrection. That's what happened to the people of Sodom. So this is not punishment for sin. Even using the model of those who prefer an imposed Roman concept, where you have a God who sits over, has a judgment, imposes punishments, even in that model, ask those who hold that model, does God impose punishment before judgment? Well, then it wasn't punishment for sin, then was it? It was something else. But see, when we, when we have this view, we look into the Old Testament and we see that there's, there's these other things going on and we get confused. Remember the quote I just read from Prophets and Kings just a moment ago about how they viewed God as arbitrarily imposing punishment. Not a natural consequence, an imposition by a divine ruler. God is created in the image of a Roman emperor. This is Satan's entire life from the beginning. And it happens only when you... see what, and, 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 when we, when we believe God's law is like Rome, an imposed law, we have to believe God punishes. Because to not do so would be unjust. It's unfair and unjust not to punish the wicked when you operate under this model. But when you understand God's law is the design protocol which life is built, what do you do when you walk in and see somebody who has hung themselves? But they're still twitching. They're not dead yet. They're breaking the law of respiration. They're, they're, they're transgressing the law of which life is built. Do you, what's justice require you to do then? Get out your belt and beat them? Punish them? Light a, fire under them? Light a fire under them? No. What justice requires if you walk in and see anybody, even the, 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 uh, the person that you dislike, what will you immediately do? You will rescue them. 
You will put them back in harmony. You'll deliver them. You won't punish them. I understand, but see, that example is a good example for, for what you're talking about. But say that you have somebody who has a knife and is stabbing that person. We can't say, oh, let the natural consequences get to that person. No, we're going to try that person and put him in jail. Right? That, or what if my for what purpose? What if my child steals a toy? I'm not going to wait for the natural consequences. I'm going to punish my child because I told him not to do it and he did it. See, I think you've got some terminology mis misstated here. Punishment comes from the word punitive. It means to exact vengeance upon. So if your child is doing something bad, you're going to take vengeance upon them or are you going to discipline your child, which comes from the root word disciple, which means to teach them a better way. What are you going to do? I may use force if it comes to it. And is the, are you using it to exact vengeance or are you using it to discipline and teach a better way? Well, I think God uses punishment to teach us a better way. Well, that's actually called discipline. The Lord disciplines those he loves. It doesn't. It's the same thing. Yeah, that's, this is why you're confused. Okay. It really is. You haven't made the distinction between exacting vengeance and disciplining and love. They're not the same. And many read the Old Testament and see God's actions of loving discipline. And they misconstrue those as exacting vengeance because they come to it with Rome's law concept in their mind. God is like a Roman emperor. He imposes, punish, he imposes law and therefore he must inflict punishment. Let's move on in the lesson and because I think this is going to come out even further when we get into some other aspects of this. This is a great discussion. I really appreciate your questions. Um, let's see here. Where were we? Okay, let, let's go. Um, we have such problems today with God's law being misunderstood and God being the author of death as it was suggested in that quote from, from, that I read earlier in Prophets and Kings that they believe God was the author of sin, suffering, and death. This comes out in the opposed law constructs in which God now must kill. He must execute the wicked. He's now the source of death. Death is coming from God as if if he didn't do it, they would live forever. But let me ask you some questions. And they give examples of Sodom and Gomorrah of God in the Old Testament as proof that God kills. You see? Is death which God told would result from unremedied sin the same thing as what Daniel experienced when God said you're going to rest in the grave till resurrection? Is death that is the result, think with me, is death that is the result of unremedied sin, the wicked in the end, what we call the second death, is that the same thing that Daniel experienced when God said you're going to rest in the grave? Which death did Sodom and Gomorrah experience? They're resting in the same grave. They're going to be resurrected. Now notice what Jesus said in Matthew 10. He said, don't be afraid of the one who can destroy the body, but the body and soul. And the word for soul, anybody know the Greek? Psyche, from which we get individuality, mind, character. See, the death that is the wages of sin is the death that doesn't simply destroy body, but it destroys your individuality and soul as well. Now, has anyone considered this? Oh, before I say that, when Jesus walked into the funeral of the little girl and they were all wailing, what did Jesus say? His words. She is asleep. She's asleep. And they, what did they do? There was a response. It's recorded in scripture. What did they do? They laughed at him. Why are they laughing? This is Jesus. Why are they laughing? Because what did they think? Now, do you believe Jesus is God in human form? Who's the author of confusion? Satan. So when Jesus says she's asleep, is Jesus trying to confuse or is he trying to be the light that lightens all, all men? Light. He's trying to lighten them. But their minds are dark and they think this is death. This isn't death. God says this is not death. How about when Lazarus was in his condition? What did he say about Lazarus to his disciples? Asleep. And the apostles are very enlightened and they understand immediately, right? No, no they're darkened too. And they said, well, if he's asleep, it'll be fine. So Jesus had to speak a language they could understand, and he said he's dead. But God in human flesh says, wait a minute. Death is not this thing you call death. Death is that thing that happens because of unremedied sin in which you no longer exist. Your individuality, your identity, your person is wiped from existence, annihilation, you're gone. That's death. This thing, this is sleep. This is not death. Now, consider this with me. Has anyone considered the possibility that the second death is actually death. It is non-existence. It's when the individuality, character, identity is permanently erased and is the result of sin and thus comes out from Satan. But the first death does not destroy the individual, does not erase identity or destroy character, but merely suspends the person in time. 
Therefore, the first death is not an outgrowth of unremedied sin, but only occurs because God has been interfering with the natural results of what sin would otherwise do in order to save and heal. If God did not step in, in multiple places and multiple ways, when man fell into sin, eternal extinction of the species would have already happened. But God's grace has been holding at bay what sin would do. And because of that, he's holding in, in, in check the full consequences. Thus, the first death, the sleep, is a mercy, an artificial state caused by God's grace to allow for the delivery and saving of the race, the minimizing of suffering and pain, and the elimination of sin. It is a mercy. So, um, just going back to uh, the flood, right? Why, it, you know, the people drowned. There was immense suffering. People drowned. They were running up mountains with their children. It was, it was absolute chaos. It was the end of the world as they knew it. It was an imposed death to them. They didn't have a choice. I mean, they didn't choose, okay, yes, I, I want to die this way. I want my children to die this way. And God imposed that judgment on them. Did they have a choice to get out of it? I yes, mean, they, they did. did. Yes, they did. But, but in their current yes. situation... Yes. God, made a, God made a choice, yes. I understand that, but I'm saying if they didn't choose God's way, right, they didn't have a, another choice. God imposed that. I mean, I just don't know how you yes. can get away from it, the point that God drowned them in a way. In a way. First off, listen to your own argument. Listen to your own argument. I just don't understand. Listen to your own argument. Okay, I will. Okay, you said, you said if they didn't choose God's way, there was no other way. That's what you just said. Right, death. It was either... That's if you, the boat or is it God's way, the way he built us, that we should breathe? And if you don't choose God's way, you decide to choose another way. What happens? <laughs> this is it. You just nailed it. God's way is the way of life. Go back and read a little more widely. The law of love is the law of life. It is the principle, the design protocol upon which God built his universe to run. Life can only exist in harmony with it. It cannot exist out of harmony with it. But did God provide the waters in which they drowned? Did God provide that situation in which they died? That's my thing. He did. Um, some would suggest, you know, the flood is actually has two possible ways. I'm open to the way that God did it, but you're still confusing what happened there, and you're calling it death. You let Jesus be the lens through which you see it, and we can say, God put them to sleep there. He drowned them. He put them to sleep. He drowned them. Their individuality was not destroyed. They died. <laughs> no, they didn't die. This is the point. I mean, they, they died the first time. Do, do you understand that they're going to be resurrected? Yes, but they died. I mean, he drowned them, people. That's what happened. I mean, did, 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 did they not? I just don't understand how you can skip that part and say, I mean, yes, I know they're asleep. But they, their life still ended in a tragic way. And their life is, but see, this is the point. Their life isn't over. I know, but... I'm but, but you're arguing like it is. On this earth. I'm talking about the first... No, it's not over on this earth. It's not over. Okay. It's not. I'm misunderstanding what I'm saying, but that's fine. It's okay. Yes, Lisa. I just want to say that um, we have to understand the consequences of their choice and, and making them responsible for the decision that they made. God warned them the flood is coming. How many years did he warn them? A hundred years. And the consequences are their own choice. So if I warn you that for 120 years that we're going to have a meteor hit this planet. There's, there's an asteroid. Our, our, our scientists have seen it. It's, spot, it's on a collision course. We have built some space arcs, space shuttles, that we can get off the planet. And we give everyone opportunity to get on. And we choose not to get off the planet. And the, and the asteroid hits the planet. And then those die. Are you going to say God killed them? Because that's what you just did. I'm sorry. Yes. Our scientists see an asteroid coming, a planet killer. And we have, we have the technology. We build, we build uh, space shuttles for enough for everybody that wants. And everybody who wants can get on a space shuttle, leave the planet before the asteroid gets here. But some choose to stay on the planet. And the asteroid hits the planet and they're wiped out. Are we going to say that God killed them? Did God send that asteroid? Is it a judgment from God? I'm just wondering... The point is, scary. what killed them? The, the, the asteroid or their refusal to get on the escape plan? It depends who sends the asteroid. Okay. Who sends it? Their choice. Right. It really doesn't matter who sends it. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Because it's imposed. It, it, the people drown. Okay. Let me, give you another, let me give you another scenario. 
And the other scenario is that the flood was a consequence of their behaviors on earth and God forewarned them and he didn't bring the flood. It was a result of the natural result of them abusing nature. It's and so, not natural. I mean, a worldwide flood is not natural. Yes. What, what do you understand the atmosphere was like on the earth before the flood? Do you understand there's a water canopy above the earth? And why did that water canopy come down? Because God made it come down. That's one. That, and, and when you believe in an imposed God like Rome, that's what you're going to believe. But when you believe in a natural law where God built things, he warned them that, they're, that what they were doing to the environment just was destroying it, and it was going to come down upon them, and he warned them to be saved. On the exact moment it came down. Because like God has foreknowledge. He knows when it's going to collapse. Exactly. He has foreknowledge. Yes, but notice, but let, let, me, let me say something. Do you all notice today there are two views of God being presented in here? Amen. There is a Roman emperor being presented who will punish you if you don't do what he says. He will send his police officers to follow you and take, and take down everything you've ever done. You're going to have to get a legal payment made. And if you don't get that payment, he is the source of your suffering. He will make you pay. He will hurt you. He will torture you. He will kill you. But there's another view where God built his universe to operate on certain laws. If you violate those laws, there is inherent suffering and death in the end, and God is working to deliver you. But if you refuse that, he gives you freedom to make your choice, but that choice results in death. In both scenarios, the people suffer and the people die who are wicked. In both scenarios, people suffer and die who are wicked. In one scenario, though, the suffering comes out from unremedied sin. In the other scenario, the suffering comes out from God who imposes it. This is Satan's lie. I will just tell you straight up, it's Satan's lie. Yes, back here. Uh, I just submit that she is, in effect, uh, stating that God is the author of sin and death and, and everything bad that's happened. That's not what I'm saying. Well, it is. It is not. Well, just... do you remember the statement out of Desire of Ages, page 761? Where, where, the, Desire of Ages, 761. Satan said in the beginning that God's law cannot be obeyed. And if man should disobey, disobey the law, every sin must be punished, urged Satan. Punishing sin is Satan's view of God and God's law. Desire of Ages 761. And when you argue that God has to punish sin, you're making God out to be the way Satan alleges him to be. Yes. Uh, in the Great Controversy, uh, page 673, uh, Ellen White talks about uh, the destruction of the wicked, how it will, will take place, uh, the, the ultimate punishment of the wicked. Uh, with including the destruction of, of Satan. I'm not going to read all of it, but just a very, very short portion of it. Uh, talking about uh, Malachi, that the wicked will be destroyed as, as, as stubble. The some are destroyed in a moment, while others suffer many days. All are punished according to their deeds. The sins of the righteous, having been transferred to Satan, he is made to suffer not only for his own rebellion, but for all the sins which he has caused God's people to commit. He is punished, uh, his punishment is to be far greater than those whom he has deceived. All, after all, have perished who fell by his deceptions. He is to st uh, still to live and suffer on. In the cleansing flames, the wicked are last destroyed. Root and branch, Satan is a root, his fall is a branch. It's the last sentence. The full penalty of the law has been visited. The demands of justice have been met. And heaven and earth, beholding, declare the righteousness of Jehovah. Do yep. so, you want to comment on that passage? Yeah, so in, in here, when she talks about the, the destruction uh, of the wicked, uh, she makes a few comments. One, that there'll be different lengths of uh, destruction, the different lengths of punishment for, for individuals, Satan being the longest, and uh, the others less so. Uh, it says that Satan uh, is made to be punished for the other sins, that there are placed upon Satan himself, and he will be uh, punished for those sins. According to this verse, he's made a, push, uh, made a punishment for the, the sins that he caused others to commit. So I think we find here that when we talk about the second death, and we talk about the, the natural consequences, that when you cut yourself off from God, the natural consequences is uh, death. That is absolutely true. Uh, but we find that is a, an incomplete picture uh, in Scripture, but not only how Ellen White describes it. And I guess the other point I would make is, if that is an incorrect understanding, if that's incorrect, that uh, you know the fire from God is not a literal fire, but it's a you know it's a mental anguish that they go through. Uh, and if in the Old Testament we talk about punish, punishment and vengeance, if those words are inaccurate in the way that the true meaning should be understood, 
I guess my point would be, why does the Bible use those words? When, when, they, when the Bible says vengeance, but they really mean loving correction. Yeah. It doesn't say loving correction, this is vengeance. You know, it doesn't say that uh, some of the interpretations uh, doesn't make sense. Why would they choose the words that they did? You see what I'm saying? That's a secondary question, and to me it's not as important as the first question that you raised in the quotation. I want to answer the quotation. And I think that you, uh, have, and I, thank you for bringing it up, because quotations like this lend themselves to confusion. And they lend themselves to confusion because of this, a couple of principles of, of, of the way people read things. One, they'll take one quotation by itself in isolation, and they don't make it conform to all the other quotations from both scripture and inspiration, and they all must harmonize. They all must harmonize. And if you have contradictory ones, then something's wrong with our understanding. So, for instance, second, uh, first selected message is page 235, uh, a paragraph where she wrote to Uriah Smith, who was the editor of Signs, and he didn't know what to do with it, so he filed it, and it was lost for 56 years and discovered and put in the select selected messages in the 1950s. And what she wrote to him was this, we are not to regard God as waiting to punish the sinner for his sin. The sinner brings the punishment upon himself. His own actions start a train of circumstances that bring the sure result. Every act of sin reacts upon the sinner and uh, makes it more easy for him to transgress again. Uh, resulting in ruin and death. This is what she says here. Well, how does that harmonize with that? Well, let's put it together with some scripture. Isaiah 33, verse 14 and 15. The sinner in Zion is terrified. Trembling grips the godless. Who can dwell with the consuming fire? Who can dwell with the eternal burning? Next verse. He who walks righteously and keeps his hands away from murder, bribe, and extortion spends eternity in the fire, not the wicked. This is what it says. So put that together with the rest of your scripture. When God came to Moses at the bush, the bush is burning, but not consumed. Sinai, burning, not consumed. Temple dedicated, glory of God's presence so bright, not consumed. Um, the, 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 and if you go through scripture, you'll find this over and over and over again. Wherever God's presence is, in fact, Hebrews 12, 29, our God is a consuming fire. If you read Revelation 14, the place where this burning happens, in Revelation 14, third angel's message, they suffer where? in the presence of the holy angels and the lamb. This is where it happens. And so the lie that Satan has perpetrated upon people is the place you don't want to go and the place you don't want to be is the place of eternal burning and consuming fire. And that place is God's very presence. The righteous are transformed and renewed by it. But the wicked, that you just described, will suffer in agony some longer than the others. Why? This is out of Patriarchs and Prophets, page 329. It says, During the long time spent in communion with God, the... the the face of Moses had reflected the glory of the divine presence. Unknown to himself, his face shone a dazzling light when he descended from the mountain. By the way, did he get third degree burns or worse, whiskers singed? No. Notice, it's not combustion. Such a light illuminated the countenance of Stephen when he uh, was before the judges. Aaron, as well as the people, shrank away from Moses. They were afraid to come near him. Seeing the confusion and terror, but ign ignorant of the cause, he urged them to come near. No, notice, notice what's happening in this. Notice what he holds out. He held out to them the pledge of God's reconciliation. He assured them of his restored favor. They perceived in his voice nothing but love and entreaty. No, is there any anger, vengeance, punishment going on here? No. Notice what happens. It's all but love, entreaty. And at last one ventured to approach. Too odd to speak, he silently pointed to the countenance of Moses and then heavenward. The great leader understood his meaning in their conscious guilt, feeling, feeling themselves under the divine displeasure. Were they under the divine displeasure? No. God is holding out to him. God's favor, his forgiveness, his love. No, they're not under. They could not endure the heavenly light which had they been obedient to God, would have filled them with joy. There is fear in guilt. The soul that is free from sin will not wish to hide from the heavenly light. Where does the torture and torment come from? From an infliction or from unremedied sin in the character? And who has the most unremedied sin in their character? Satan. And it's the fires of truth and love. I'll give you some more evidences because we ought to present this on evidence. It's not speculation. When the, when the sons of, uh, of Aaron took unauthorized fire in before the Lord, what happened? Read the scripture. Fire came out from the Lord and consumed them. And they died before the Lord. Next verses. Moses sends in the cousins dragging them out still in their tunics. That's what it says right in scripture. If I hit you with a flamethrower and burn you till you're consumed and die, will you still be in your clothes when I'm done? <laughs> then what's it mean? What's the implication here? This is not fire of combustion. It's not. 
See, this fire, what's Ellen White said? To sin wherever it is found, our God is? Consuming fire. Consuming fire. This fire consumes sin. What does sin, what is sin made out of? It's not made out of molecules. Ideas. Ideas. And at its root, there are two root elements to sin. Satan is the father of? Lies. lies. What is it that consumes and destroys lie? And Satan is the father also of selfishness, which is the opposite of love, and love consumes selfishness. And so God is the God of truth and the God of love. When the Spirit fell at Pentecost, the Spirit of truth and love fell, they saw tongues of? Fire. Fire. Did anyone get consumed? No. No. And so you put all the pieces together, and what you find is exactly what you read in Great Controversy, but now we're under the natural law model. God reveals himself. As it says in Daniel 7, he takes his throne, and rivers of fire come out before him, and thousands and times thousand, and ten thousand times ten thousand are standing in this fire. But to the wicked, whose consciences are guilt-ridden, they don't want the truth. They agonize because they don't want to see who they really are. They don't want to experience the suffering of an un- uh, uh, of a conscience that's unhealed. They don't, wanna, they, don't wanna, they don't want to have the reality of the pain and suffering that they've inflicted to others come full bore into their awareness because when you commit sin and you hurt somebody else, you either repent and are reconciled or you deny and you distort. It wasn't me. It was the woman you gave me. I didn't do anything wrong. And this is piling wrath upon the day of wrath that Paul talks about. Every lie you tell yourself to hide behind is piled up so you can justify that you are righteous when you're not. And when the stand in the presence of un- veiled truth and love those lies don't work anymore you see yourself for exactly who you are and you see the wickedness and you understand in the fullness the pain you've caused others and this causes the most terrible torment and if you talk about christ as our substitute what caused his most torment the physical suffering or the mental anguish and so it is the mental anguish that they suffer in those fires and satan suffers the most because he's done the most wickedness this is exactly right and in the end what happens is they die And once they're dead, another fire comes. Once they're dead, a fire that consumes the elements that Peter talks about, and all the elements melt in fervent heat comes. And then the system that that tried to teach these things, when do you ever find them burning animals alive? They only burn dead animals. It's a metaphor. The fires of combustion only come when the wicked are dead. This is what happens. Okay, what you got? Well, I think you, I think you raise a, a very good point. Um, one is that we have to find, and I think there is consistency uh, throughout not only the scripture, of course, uh, but also in, in Ellen Rice's writing. I think that's that's true. And I also, you know, I, the passage about how we are not to regard uh, God as waiting to punish a sinner—that is absolutely true. I, I think in your uh, view, you view that in the ultimate context, the ultimate punishment, the ultimate end of sin. Uh, but the way I view uh, her writings on, on that particular topic is that even on, on this earth, right, uh, there are natural consequences to sin. You know, uh, if I only on this earth or eternity too. Well, let me let me get there. So on this earth, there are absolutely natural consequences to sin. You know, if I run out in front of a speeding car and I'm struck and I'm dead and I'm, I'm, I died, God didn't impose that death upon me. That is a natural consequence of my own choices. The, the Jews in their day, uh, when they saw the, the, the suffering, the sick, said, who, who sinned? Is it him or his father? Who gave him this leprosy, right? So no, no, God, God didn't give this guy this leprosy, right? This is consequences of our own choices. That is absolutely true. Now, but I do think there's a distinction between the, the consequences of sin on this earth and the ultimate consequences of the end times. Let, let me interrupt you. Let me interrupt you. Because you, you say there's a distinction. What happens to the person who exploits other people? I'm, I'm a child molester. Mm-hmm. I ask my patients regularly, because in, 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 I deal with a lot of women who have been molested as kids. And in the healing process, there comes a point in the proper time where they have to deal with their own resentment, anger, and bitterness. And we talk about, in their heart and mind, forgiving the person who did that to lay down the bitterness and resentment and not carry it anymore. And, and invariably, they always resist this. And, and so, and there's this, this idea that often happens, well, he wasn't caught, he wasn't punished. No one, if, I, if, I don't, if I don't hold this against him, he'll get away with it. I'm not going to let him get away with it. There's this idea. And so I asked them this question. 
If God took you to heaven and gave you a choice, one choice between two op- options, you're in heaven, you're talking to the Lord, the Lord says, I'm going to give you two options. Option one, you go back, your life is exactly as it's been, no difference, you pick up where you left off. Option two, if you want, I will let you trade lives with the person who molested you. You'll go around molesting kids and no one will molest you. Whose life do you choose? 100% of my patients always choose their own life. Why? Because I, before, before I asked the question, I asked, who got hurt worse? You were the person who molested you. Well, I got hurt worse. Once I asked this question, I go, why? Then they realize, no, no, I didn't. I might have gotten hurt psychologically, emotionally, even physically, but my conscience is clear. My soul is still un, unsullied. It's pure. But when we perpetrate evil against another person, we sear our consciences, we warp our characters, we sully our souls. This is an automatic, unavoidable consequence that happens, and it cannot be avoided. Sin punishes the sinner. This is the truth. And if you persist in it long enough, Paul says they sear their consciences with a hot iron. Um, We destroy the very faculties God has given us, the conscience and the reason, that discern and understand truth. And we persist in sin long enough, we become unresponsive to the Holy Spirit. Love doesn't move us, truth doesn't move us, and God can't reach us. That's what happens, and that's a consequence, not an imposition. And when that happens, there is nothing but ruin and death left. So that quotation in selected messages does apply to the the earthly consequences, but it even more applies to the eternal consequences. Hey, I promise this will be my last point. (laughs) Uh, Also in first selected messages, uh, she also does talk about the the end time as well in the same uh, time period covered in great controversy. Uh, and she comments it uh, in an interesting and light. And again, this is a very short quotation. So Satan rushes into the midst and tries to stir up the multitude to action. But the fire from God of heaven is rained upon them. And the great men, the mighty men, the noble, the poor, the miserable men are all consumed together. I saw that there were some quickly destroyed while others suffered longer. They were punished according to the deeds done in the body. Some were many days consuming just as long as there was a portion of them unconsumed, all sense of suffering was theirs. Said the angel, the worm of life shall not die. Their fire shall not be quenched as long as there is at least particle for them to prey upon. Does anybody in here think that I already didn't answer that? Yeah. That's already been explained. Yeah. It's already been answered. It's the, it's the fires of love and truth burning through their piled up lies and distortions as they come face to face with their life record book and the great panorama. Put the other text with it. This is what happens when you take text out of isolation, you get distortion. Put the other text with it, with the great panorama and the agony and the suffering as they come face. And and some burn longer because some have a much longer history of sin that has to be reviewed and processed through the circuitry. This is why some are longer suffering as they come face to face with themselves and their own nature and character. Yes. In either one of those things he read, I never heard her saying, God punished. They will be punished, but she doesn't say God did. And I wonder, what is it in us as humans that are so determined that God is going to do this evil thing to everybody so that we get avenged? I mean, think about it this way. If, if Satan says, hey, God, I never, hey guys, I never said God wasn't powerful. I never said he wasn't powerful. I said he's not good. If he could just get a little self-restraint, if he could just hold his anger and wrath in check, if he wouldn't lash out against us, well, we could live for eternity in sin because there's nothing wrong with sin. There's something wrong with God who'll kill us for it. That's what you're arguing. God's the killer. I prefer to believe in a God who is a God of love and not a God like Hitler who enjoys torturing people. Exactly, yes. It's solved easily to me when you think of this. I'm a parent. Is there anything in the world my children could do that I want to see them burn alive and tortured? And the longer they're tortured, the better I feel because they've turned against me? Is there anything as a parent no. that you would do to destroy your children like that, no matter what they did? I'm going to, te- I'm going to tell you, Ellen White says a great conversation. The final issue is over the, the, the battle that started in the beginning over God's law. When you believe God is like a Roman emperor and imposes law, you must believe in an imposed punishment or there's no justice. It's only until you can accept the truth that God's law is not like Rome, it's the design protocol of life that you can actually let that go and not demand it. And what we're arguing for, for people who, who see this, we're arguing for an unjust God in their eyes. That's what, the, that's what they say. Over here, you've had your hand up for a long time. 
Isaiah 9, if you want to have scripture behind that, Isaiah 9, 18 says, Surely wickedness burns like a fire. It consumes briars and thorns. It sets the forest thickets ablaze so that it rolls upward in a column of smoke. By the wrath of the Lord Almighty, the land will be scorched, and the people will be fuel for the fire. No one will spare his brother. Well said, yes. Um, over here, next hand. I see God as a, a parent that has to use tough love at times. And I see the flood as a situation, a Sodom and Gomorrah as a situation where possibly, let's say in a family, you have a child who you've been working with and appealing to and trying to love, but that child continues to resist and creates disharmony long enough in the home that it's destroying the home and the happiness and the well-being of the other children. And so in tough love, that parent may have to say to that child, you're going to have to leave our home until you choose to live in harmony with our home and the happiness of our home. You're welcome back at any time. Please come back. But for a time, you're going to have to stay outside of this house. There's some utilitarian, there's some usefulness in that analogy. Um, but even that walks down the imposed law construct because it's an imposition to put them out. It's not a natural result. And if we would go, uh, but there's usefulness in that analogy. Um, an analogy that I think is a little better, an, 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 another, an, yeah, so, so the, the imposition is a discipline not the ultimate consequence. The ultimate consequence and the imposition is done either because they're into drugs and then, and then the violation of the, the, the laws of health are destroying them. You're trying to protect them with an intervention to save them or they're, they're into rebelliousness so their characters are becoming more selfish and hard-hearted and they're becoming more alienated from God and the inter imposed intervention is trying to help them. That's right, but I want to make sure that this, this imposed intervention is not the punishment. No, it's, it's only temporary to save them, to draw them back to exactly. time, time to wake up. Russell. Uh, yeah, I want to publicly thank and affirm those who have made comments and questions in here because I have personally struggled with these issues myself and I can only imagine that there may be someone listening online, someone watching on the webcast who is struggling with these as well. And I want to thank Andrew and Lily as well. It take a lot of courage, and I'm, I'm a pretty hard person to argue with. And, and so, I, no, I, I really appreciate both of you giving those, those perspectives. Exactly. So uh, we and, and we absolutely respect your right to think that. We don't think less of you for that at all. That's right. With honest-hearted people. I know, for instance, I thought and argued some of the, I got some papers I went back and looked that are about 20, maybe 30 years old, that I actually wrote and argued some of these very same points about 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, wait, wait. No, no, Ken's next. Ken's next. Uh, somewhere in this discussion, I heard the idea that somehow authority, whether it's government authority or whether it's the imposed law authority, that somehow that authority doesn't deserve to be equated with God. And it probably doesn't. <laughs> okay, but. Romans 13 says that authorities are, are put in place by God. They are his servants. And, it, and Paul very clearly says, be afraid. Be very afraid if you break those laws. Yeah, and that's exactly what the Nazis used to get a lot of good Adventists, actually. And I've got some papers on how the Adventists were working in collaboration with the Nazis because Hitler was a vegetarian and uh, did practice a lot of the principles of Adventism. And they used this very thing that you should, uh, you should submit yourself to the laws of the land. And um, it can obviously be abused. Yeah. But so, I'm just saying that it's there. You know, you have to deal with it. So it's... The yes, and, and there are elements or whether there are authorities established or instituted or elected by birth or by by an election, they're there. You have to deal with it. You know, and, and I don't I don't have any problem with it. I don't have any problem with a God who will say and yes I think to a government to execute someone who took someone's life prematurely. Yeah, but see those executions carried out by governments on earth are not God's punishment for sin. That's right. They'll be raised again. 
That's some people, some people who've been executed by governments on earth accepted Jesus Christ in prison before their execution. They're going to be in the resurrection of the righteous. But they were still executed by a government on earth. This is not punishment for sin. Right. Look at the thief on the cross, executed by a human government next to Christ, but he's coming up in the right resurrection. Even though he committed crimes, he was punished for his crimes on earth. That is not the punishment for sin. And until we can get our minds around that idea, we continue to misunderstand God and distort the divine character. I mean, this is the bottom line. We have to make a distinction between mercy which is a suspended animation. Every being who has died thus far in human history this is, it was suspended in time waiting for the resurrection of one or the other. Nobody is annihilated and extinct from existence and gone. That, and, the, and the punishment for sin, if you want to use the word punishment, is eternal non-existence. It hasn't happened. But yet we look back on that and we try to then extrapolate and apply it to the future. And this causes gross misunderstanding. Rather than seeing mercy, God mercifully acting to keep open the channel for Messiah because Satan is working in the controversy to close down the avenue because God is not going to have Jesus born to Jezebel. And if he gets every woman on earth to be like a Jezebel, then, then there's no place for the Messiah to come. And at one time in human history, there was one righteous man left on the earth and his family. The avenue for which God could work was becoming extremely narrow. And so we say, God punishes! No, God mercifully intervenes to keep open the avenue for Messiah. It's grace. It's grace if you understand God's law is a law of love, but it's punishment if it's the imposed Roman construct. Same behavior seen through two different lenses. And this is the war. How do you understand God's law? That's what it's over. His law, his government, his nature, his character. That's the final test question. How will you answer? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have given abundant evidence. Evidence of your love, your nature, your character, the way you want things to operate. Lord, it has been a long battle. It's been going on for thousands of years. And it's waging, as it says in Corinthians, we war against everything that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we're to take captive every thought to you, Lord. And there's so many ideas circulating around that misrepresent you. We ask for your spirit. To give us wisdom. Give us discernment. Help us see your nature and your character as Jesus revealed it to be. A nature of supreme love and grace and mercy and forgiveness. A being who on earth never sought to hurt those who were seeking to hurt him. But got down and washed the feet of his betrayer. Acting always in love leaving people free. May we follow your methods. May we model ourselves after Christ. May we see you soon. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen.